Throughout the years, scientists have made some discoveries that seem to hint at the existence of extraterrestrial life. But do they really? Let's find out. In 1976, NASA's Viking Mars landers detected chemical signatures that could be a sign of extraterrestrial life. During one of the experiments, Martian soil was mixed with special nutrients and then tested for the production of methane gas. And the test's result was positive. In other words, something in the soil was metabolizing these nutrients and producing the gas. Unfortunately, other experiments conducted on board the landers didn't show any evidence of life. It caused NASA to declare the result a false positive. And still, some scientists keep standing by the finding, arguing that the experiments on board were ill-equipped to look for a key indicator of life, organic molecules. In 1977, an Ohio State University radio telescope detected a bizarre pulse of radiation coming from someplace near the Sagittarius constellation. It lasted 37 seconds and was so unexpected that the astronomer who was monitoring the data at that moment scribbled, wow, on the telescope's printout. The thing is that the radio frequency of the signal is internationally banned on Earth. The signal could be the result of a supermassive astronomical event, or it could be sent by some kind of intelligent life with immensely powerful transmitters. So far, this mystery has remained unexplained. In 1996, NASA scientists announced that they had found something that could be microbes in a potato-shaped chunk of Martian rock. The meteorite might have been blasted off the surface of Mars in a collision. It had been wandering the solar system for about 15 million years before it fell in Antarctica. Analyses showed that the meteorite contained some organic molecules and tiny particles of the mineral called magnetite. It's sometimes found in bacteria living on our planet. NASA researchers used an electron microscope and announced that they had spotted nanobacteria. But since that time, this evidence has been called into question a few times. Some experts say that the particles of magnitude are not really similar to those found on our planet. And Earth's contaminants are likely to be the source of organic molecules. Jupiter's moon Europa has a bizarre red tinge. Some of the theories explaining this phenomenon have suggested the reason is frozen bits of bacteria, which are also responsible for the mysterious infrared signal the moon gives off. But this theory hasn't been proven yet. The existence of life in Venus's clouds might explain curious anomalies in the composition of the planet's atmosphere. Solar radiation and lightning are supposed to generate tons of carbon monoxide on Venus. But in reality, this gas is rare as if something is removing it. Another weird thing is the presence of both hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. Usually, these two readily react together. That's why it's rare to find them coexisting. The only explanation can be that some process keeps churning them out. But probably the most mysterious is the presence of carbonyl sulfide. The thing is, on Earth, it's only produced by microbes and not by some inorganic process. Some experts believe that microbes might be living in the atmosphere of Venus. The surface of the planet, scorching hot and acidic, isn't very suitable for the development of life. But up in the atmosphere, it's moist and hospitable, with a pressure similar to Earth and pleasant temperatures. But again, we haven't received any solid proof yet. In 2003, scientists discussed the possibility that the traces of sulfur on Jupiter's moon Europa could be the waste products of colonies of underground bacteria. The compounds were first discovered by the Galileo space probe, which also found some evidence of a volcanically warmed ocean beneath the icy crust of the moon. The sulfur signatures look similar to the waste products of bacteria living in the surface ice covering lakes in Antarctica on Earth. But other scientists rejected the idea. They argued that the sulfur could have come from the neighboring moon. I.O. there, it's found in abundance. It's September 1977. You're playing one of the first video game consoles released in North America. You step outside and see the whole neighborhood waiting for Voyager 1 to launch. It's a super sunny day, so you squint a little, trying to see what's happening. You live in the neighborhood right outside the launching station. You get yourself some food and watch the Voyager take off into space. 
you're so impressed, you decide to dedicate your career to working with NASA. 35 years later, you're now a senior official in NASA, specializing in Voyager 1. It's 2012, and you're sitting in the control room with your colleagues. Everyone is staring at their computer screens as they work on the Voyager. You're sitting on the top, overlooking everything and making sure all systems are in check. This day is special, as Voyager 1 is about to exit the heliosphere, which is a science word for the outer shell of our solar system. It's a bubble of space affected by the solar wind, which comes from the sun. By 2021, it got 14 billion miles away from Earth, which is equivalent to 153 astronomical units from the sun. One astronomical unit is the distance between the sun and the Earth. The craft was originally meant to fly by Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter, and toss itself from one planet to another with the use of their gravitational pull. Everyone is impatiently waiting for it to exit the heliosphere. Three, two, one, and it's officially out. All systems are normal and functioning. You praise your team for doing an excellent job. With Voyager 1 reaching this far, there's still tons to explore in outer space. You were once a young adult, watching the craft launch outside your neighborhood. And now, you're the main person in charge of the operation. Nine years later. Since Voyager 1 left the heliosphere, you've been checking up on it every now and then, making sure all systems and functions are in order. It's been sending back measurements of the interstellar medium. It's the area between the stars of our galaxy, consisting of ionized materials. Ionized is basically a simple version of a molecule or substance. The interstellar medium is an electrically charged state of plasma, or ionized plasma, and is very unstable. It's like going from lightning in a thunderstorm back to calm rain in a matter of seconds. The plasma up there is different than the plasma on Earth, in that it's difficult to filter out. There are around 0.06 atoms for every cubic inch in the interstellar medium. The air we breathe on Earth has billions of atoms. By measuring the plasma in the interstellar medium, we can further understand the behavior and structure of chemicals and gases. It's possible that the oxygen we know and love on Earth is different than the ones out there. One of your main tasks is to learn more about how the solar wind from the sun and interstellar medium interact with each other to create the heliosphere. So, after doing some routine checkups and other maintenance work on Voyager 1 from the control room, you notice something strange coming from the screen. You sit in front of the computer, crunching the numbers of the plasma vibrations and convert them into an audio file of about 3 kilohertz. You click on it and listen to an eerie, subtle hum. You and your team are surprised that these vibrations occurred in such a small frequency. Given that space is massive, something like this might mean life on other planets. Everyone else at the station rushes to the control room to listen to that sound from outer space. It's monotonous and faint, but it's definitely coming from outside the heliosphere. You run the numbers over and over to make sure it's not a fluke, but it's on point. You make sure your team doesn't spill the beans to anyone outside until everything is known and clear. You get into beast mode with work and try to catch the sound again, and it remains. You can't sleep trying to think of something that could be producing this hum. A few days pass by, and the sound is pretty consistent. If there was some life out there trying to communicate with you, then surely it would have said something that can be deciphered. You analyze the audio files once again, trying to see if it's some phonetic language you don't know. You call in a linguist to see if she can make something out of it. You and the squad gather around, waiting impatiently for some answers. After a while, she believes that it might be someone out there communicating with us, but the only way to find out is by sending something back to them. You arrange a meeting with your team and try to figure out what message you can send. After much thinking and lots of coffee, you decide to send them one phrase in English. Who are you? You send out the signal through Voyager 1 and wait for any changes in the hum, but you don't get anything straight away. It may take some time for a response. You wait all night and still there's nothing. 
it's starting to look like there isn't anything out there. For the next couple of days, you keep sending out phrases for anything to pick up. Since space is a vacuum, sound waves can't travel. So sending out voice messages on a large speaker won't work. You locate the source of the humming and aim for it when sending the audio file. Every day, you send something different, but still, you don't hear anything from them for a week. It seems that intelligent life in the distant world isn't real. The areas between the star systems and a galaxy aren't necessarily a complete vacuum. That's where the interstellar medium is. It contains gases, dust, and cosmic rays, which are energy particles. After many months of this constant humming being produced, you still try to figure out what's going on. You sit there, remembering the time when the Voyager was first launched. You remember running outside after playing some video games. You couldn't see properly because of the sun, and you freeze in your spot and have a eureka moment. You go through some notes taken in the past. The answer was in front of you all this time. Every now and then, the sun sends a burst of energy that causes the plasma of interstellar space to vibrate. Scientists can measure the frequency of waves when the plasma vibrates to show how close they are to each other. And on the day when the hum was delivered, there were some irregular frequencies coming from the sun. So that hum might have been the plasma vibrating in a weird way because of the sun flares. But these low-level vibrations last longer than quick jumps and spikes. They're fainter. You run the tests again and find out that it's not some intelligent life forms out there trying to talk to you. It's the little vibrations caused by sun flares. You notify your team about this breakthrough and everyone's celebrating. But after all these tests and research, you still don't know why plasma hmm. in the interstellar medium vibrates in such a way. Those answers will have to wait. 2027. It's been 50 years since the launch of Voyager 1. You're way into your senior years and just retired from NASA. You have many scholarships in your name and programs for young people who want to learn about space and science. You go back to the control room once more, where you thought you had discovered intelligent life on a distant world. Then you remember all the good times you had. You say goodbye to everything, knowing that this is Voyager's final moments. It was built to last up to 50 years. After that, it'll just be a floating object in the vastness of space. It's already surprising to know that this is Earth's most distant object from us. But it's time to let others take your place. You shut off the lights and close the door. The Voyager makes one last beep before eternal silence. The universe is expanding. And if it's expanding, then it probably had a beginning somewhere. Now all we have to do is to run time backward and see where the beginning was. It took the scientists many more years to come up with a full-fledged theory. The Big Bang Theory. And here it is. Nothing has ever been anywhere, because neither when nor where existed. But actually, no. There was one thing. It was the so-called cosmic singularity. A state of our universe in which it was incredibly small, dense, and very, very hot. Imagine if our universe was compressed into a small ball. The pressure and temperature inside would be enormous. At some point it became impossible to withstand them. And here comes the Big Bang. It was an outburst of energy and matter that created everything we see now. Time and space, basic physical forces. It also scattered quarks everywhere. These quarks, tiny particles that make up our world, were all boiling in an incredibly hot cosmic broth. When it cooled down, gravity began to attract them to each other. They gathered into atoms, then molecules, and then into the first objects in the world. Stars. But what was before that? Alan Harvey Guth, an American theoretical physicist and cosmologist, has devoted his whole life to solving this mystery. After learning about the Big Bang Theory, Guth found some flaws in it. For example, the distribution of matter was very even, although it shouldn't have been. If we drop the balloon filled with paint down, it will burst, and we'll see absolute chaos on the canvas. But the early universe don't look like. The early universe was very even and proportional. That was Guth's discovery. 
the theory of inflation. Here's what it says. Even before the Big Bang, there was some kind of force that could give the bang a strong acceleration, something that was able to distribute everything in space instantly and evenly. Martin Boyovald is a German professor of physics, and in his opinion, the universe was born quite differently. According to Martin's theory, the singularity couldn't just appear out of nowhere. Let's look at a pendulum on the old clock. The pendulum rotates back and forth. Its movement is smooth, continuous, and non-stop. This is how we usually see time. It flows and never stops. But quantum time doesn't work that way. It consists of small segments and makes short pauses. And just like with the second hand of a clock, the beginning of one segment of time is always the end of another. According to the Big Bang Theory, once upon a time, our universe began to expand, inflate like a balloon. But sooner or later, it will blow away back. The universe will start shrinking and return to the state of cosmic singularity. And then, the Big Bang too. Nothing appears out of nowhere and disappears into nowhere. According to Boyovald's theory, the beginning of each universe is the end of the previous one. Our universe is not at all the first and not the last. Millions of similar universes existed before us and will exist after us. This theory, although it sounds very logical, is far from complete. So for now, all this is just a hypothesis. But some people come up with even stranger ideas. Neil Turok, a South African physicist, and his colleague Paul Steinhardt, an American theoretical physicist. They say that yes, our universe isn't the first one. Our universe is just one of an infinite number of others. And all of us are stuck in a cycle of endless rebirths of parallel worlds. According to this theory, our universe is located inside a so-called brain, as in membrane. In other words, we're stuck in some kind of elastic surface that's capable of contracting, stretching, oscillating, and so on. Like pieces of fabric on a rope. Another universe may be an inch from ours, but we can't see it. That's because there's a tiny space between us, and this tiny space contains the fourth dimension. How do these universes originate? Through brain collision. These brains are getting closer to each other very, very slowly, until they finally collide. Their collision creates two big bangs and two parallel universes. Then they're moving away from each other. The created worlds continue to live. We're currently at this stage. Remember the inflation theory? There was a mysterious energy that pushed and accelerated the Big Bang. Well, if we did collide with another universe, that would explain everything. Which idea is closer to you? How about the idea of subscribing? Subscribe.